okay, and it looks like we have everyone. It's 901 and I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of September 15th, uh, 2023. We have uh, four hospitals left and a fairly compressed time schedule. Um, it'll be CVMC and Porter. We'll bring back Dr. Merman and then we'll finish up. So I'll turn it over to Director Lindbergh for the presentation. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Are you able to see the slide and hear me all right? Okay, great. So we won't spend much time with the setup. Uh, you've heard it from me before, but just as a reminder, uh, the process we're using for deliberations in fiscal year 24 is a first pass where we determine whether or not the um, NPR and FPP growth from fiscal year 22 actuals to fiscal year 24 budgets was below the all payer model growth of 8.6% or less. Um, if not, uh, we evaluate uh, the factors that we've discussed here and try to weigh those in determining um, how to establish a budget for fiscal year 24. Um, so I will switch over to our summary for CVMC, Central Vermont Medical Center. All right, so starting at the top, we see that uh, Central Vermont Medical Center's uh, NPR has been adjusted uh, or was adjusted in fiscal years 21 and 22, um, and there had been some rate changes um, in pretty much every year along the way since fiscal year 18. Um, their operating expense growth has generally been uh, unadjusted uh, on budgets, and we see that there is a uh, Reliance on the commercial rate in recent years between two to four percent annually, um, and as submitted, the uh, kind of weighted weight, <clears throat> the weighted commercial approved increase would be eight point two percent. We see that they have a pretty low uh, proportion of commercial payers in their payer mix uh, for a hospital of their size, in particular. And again, we see that uh, trend where fiscal year 2020, 2020 uh, operating results were uh, very challenging for most hospitals. Uh, as far as expense growth factors, um, the per FTE labor increase is at 4.1%, which was the eighth highest among Vermont hospitals. Utilization at 8%, which was ninth highest. Again, that's one um, that even though it's twice the upper end of the benchmark is not necessarily something that I would view as a bad thing um, with the access issues we have. Um, it's encouraging to see those kind of numbers that have um, been uh, achievable. These are actual results and uh, they're trying to continue those. Pharmaceutical expenses are within the benchmark uh, at 7.6% uh, uh, at fourth highest. That's a, probably due to the pharmaceutical mix of uh, drugs being delivered more than anything else. Uh, and at cost inflation at five, 3.7% was fifth highest and right at the median among Vermont hospitals. As far as uh, the year-to-date results as compared to the budget, you can see that the year-to-date is at negative 2.6% margin versus 1% margin, and the operating a bit of margin at zero um, instead of four, which was budgeted. So um, those are certainly um, improvements from the fiscal year 22 actuals, but um, still showing a, a long way to go in terms of recovery for this hospital. Um, we see that uh, the ratio of administrative and general salaries, which we adjusted for the University of Vermont Network Hospitals, uh, was adjusted upward um, from 20.8% in the cost reports as initially reviewed to 30.9% to account for their share of the shared services in the University of Vermont Health Network. Uh, that ratio is 12th highest among Vermont hospitals and in the 96th percentile among its comparators. The CMI adjusted cost per Medicare discharge at uh, just over $12,000 uh, is right in the middle among Vermont hospitals and was at the 83rd percentile among the comparator group. And as far as the uh, relative cost and pricing goes for inpatient, we see uh, quite a low commercial cost coverage on the inpatient side. So seeing those values below 100% means that um, the Medicare allowable cost is not being covered by commercial payers. Um, and we see that their standardized price uh, for inpatient services is within the interquartile range. Um, as far as outpatient goes, we see uh, you know more substantial cost coverage uh, north of Oop. 
Director Lindbergh, um, I think you've frozen up. I, I um, can't hear you anymore. Is anyone else having that issue? Um, yes. Kathy, I, oh, and I am, yeah. She's in this uh, chair poster. She's in the state office at National Life. So let me see what's happening with the internet over there. Hey, uh, wouldn't be a last day without some technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> just a moment while I try to. Um, no internet. Interesting. I was trying to freeze you so you could not leave us. <laughs> I'm going to try a different uh, internet uh, source. Uh, see if that helps. Uh, appreciate your patience. Lo siento. Um, I think we're good now. All right. Uh, so let me bring that back up. Sorry. <laughs> the internet just stopped working. I don't know. I, I, I <laughs> Sorry, this probably isn't the time or place, but I was reminded that my first day of work for the state of Vermont, there was an earthquake. So just be careful. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so anyway, on the outpatient side, seeing more favorable cost coverage, um, uh, but uh, you know, uh, still uh, relatively lower um, than uh, on the lower side towards that 25th percentile uh, among peers, um, and seeing that the standardized price there is within the interquartile range as well. So any uh, questions about this summary before we uh, move on to the PowerPoint presentation? Okay, great. <clears throat> So, all right, our folks seeing uh, Central Vermont Medical Center budget request in front of their eyes. Wonderful. So, uh, we see that the uh, approved budget in fiscal year 23 was a 12% growth rate in NPR, and they submitted another 15% growth rate for a two year uh, rate of growth of 21.4%. The change in charge over that time period was 10% uh, approved in 23, another 10% requested for 24 for 20% over the two years. Um, but when we look at the change in uh, commercial effective rate, uh, the rate approved in 23 was 12.5% and the request for fiscal year 24 was 10.9% for, for a two year rate of 23.45%. If we were going to hold that growth to seven years, uh, seven percent over two years, um, we would need to adjust <clears throat> NPR down by uh, almost 11 percent, which would be done through a charge decrease of three percent and a commercial effective rate of negative 5.5 percent. If we were to constrain growth to inflation from fiscal year 23 projection to the fiscal 24 budget, you would see um, a 15.6% growth rate over the two years. So a little bit more balance across the two years in this request. Um, but that still would involve a you know, 6% uh, downward adjustment to NPR. Uh, reviewing the performance summary for Central Vermont Medical Center, um, expense growth was right at the median uh, from fiscal year 22 to 24 uh, at 8.3%, notably below that all pair model um, growth rate of 8.6%. Um, we just discussed some of these numbers related to the proportion of administrative and general salaries to clinical salaries, which was at the 96th percentile after making the adjustment um, and the cost per adjusted, uh, the CMI adjusted cost per Medicare discharge was in the 83rd percentile, seeing much uh, lower relative standard price for inpatient um, and right at the median for outpatient. And when we look at the longer term change in charge um, over the Five years at 37%, that's the highest um, amount of increase in that time period, or I'm sorry, the lowest amount of increase in that time period. Um, and we see that um, the 10 year uh, amount is in the 23rd percentile. So uh, again, just 
of note uh, that this hospital is behind its budget um, for fiscal year 23. So um, we see that that's largely being driven by uh, less NPR and FPP than was in the budget. So that negative 2.6% um, operating margin um, and relatively low days cash on hand are both um, signs of concern from a um, fiscal stability standpoint. Um, and reminding us of an analysis that was shared last week. So um, part of the benchmarks that were shared about uh, how other hospitals deal with these shared services came from a company called Centellus. And if you were going to kind of allocate Vermont share uh, for each of its hospitals of those shared services and compare that to the median uh, amount of expense, you would expect the opportunity, uh, potential opportunity for um, some considering uh, some opportunities for shared um, reducing those shared expenses is uh, 14.41 million uh, for CVMC. So the staff recommendation would be to modify the budget as follows. Um, I would recommend adjusting the NPR and FPP growth down uh, to 14.4 from 21.4. That's just accommodating uh, the kind of uh, rebasing based on the current margin uh, to get that two year growth uh, more in line with where it looks like 23 is landing and then adjust the charge down from 10% to 5%. Um, also, uh, condition, an addition, additional condition for monthly reporting uh, submitted within three months uh, with that improvement plan. Uh, our rationale, again, is that uh, operating results are about 6% under budget. Uh, in the case of CBMC expense growth and standardized prices are at or below the median. Um, and, you know, we do see some of these opportunities to potentially increase efficiency across the UVM health network. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you. Um, I'll open it up to the my fellow board members for any questions or comments. And maybe it makes sense to go in the same order as we did last time, which I think it was Lunge, member of Walsh, member of Holmes, and then myself. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. Um, I am supportive of the staff recommendation. I think. Um, the downward adjustment to NPR is important, so we're not setting the hospital up for a negative margin, um, just given where they are com coming in in 23 compared to their budget. So I think that still gives plenty of room to increase access. Um, so I'm supportive of that. And that's about all I have to say. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Sarah, uh, for the presentation. Um, I'm in agreement with the decrease in NPR. I'm concerned about the 5% increase in charge. I'm not quite uh, ready to go with that. Um, I'm concerned about the high admin ratio and the rapidly and, and their high costs and rapidly rising prices. Um, and they're part of a network that's the network's year to date performance. Um, has been much greater than expected. It has the ability to generate additional revenue with its CMI initiative. And there's huge potential uh, for savings from the shared resources. Here, we, we see no demonstrated savings from shared resources. The administrative to clinician ratio um, is very high here. Um, and they're, they're part of an interdependent uh, network. And I think that that's an important thing to consider. Um, these three hospitals um, have the ability to help each other out. <clears throat> they are interdependent. Um, that's why member Merman was asked to uh, recuse or abstain. So I could be comfortable with 3.1 uh, for the charge increase, but I'm not comfortable with five. So thank you again, uh, Director Lindbergh, for your presentation and your thoughtful analysis here. Um, this is a hospital that struggles year after year to make a margin despite having re relatively higher growth rates in their commercial rate over the past few years. So I think continuing to increase rate at more than double inflation is not likely to be the path to sustainability here. Um, I didn't find enough information in the submission to support a commercial rate growth of 23.5% over two years. And I think part of that is 
the network's decision to submit a network narrative rather than a full narrative for each hospital. So next year, I'm hoping to see a separate narrative for each hospital. So we have really more in-depth information on what's happening um, at both Porter and CVMC. Um, I, I will say that I support the staff recommendation for a change in charge increase of 5%. Um, this exceeds CVMC's own estimate of cost inflation. It should provide a glide path for this struggling hospital. Um, while I think you know the hope is that there's greater network efficiencies and admin savings are realized at the network level to um, you know, earlier points there, I worry about the day's cash on hand um, at this particular hospital. So I am okay and comfortable with a 5% change in charge here. Given the tendency to overestimate NPR and underperform on the budget, I think the downward adjustment to uh, NPR is reasonable. So I support that and I support the uh, additional condition about adding uh, an implementation plan to reduce uh, costs and reduce that admin. So I support the motion as we see it. Thank you. Um, I don't have much to add. I'll incorporate some of my comments from um, the medical center because I think some of those comments are relevant here. Um, I am concerned about the need to support this hospital. I'm worried about the low day, days cash on hand. And I'm my view is there is a balance in sustainability and supporting our hospitals and affordability. And that's often a hard balance, but I do support the higher um, charge increase. So I support the motion and the staff recommendation at 14.4 and 5.0 so that the hospital has the resources it needs. I agree with Member Holmes' comment about providing the support um, needed uh, so that these the hopes that some of those savings can happen. It doesn't happen overnight. So I do support the higher um, charge increase. Um, I have nothing else, um, uh, although I will say that I agree with Member Holmes that perhaps a separate narrative submission would be beneficial um, so that CBMC has more uh, opportunity to uh, share their views. Um, I will open it up to, I'll go to the healthcare advocate first if they have any comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I have very much the same comment you've heard me give all year. Um, we stand by our written comments, uh, and um, uh, which which significantly is, you know, includes linking growth rate to um, a standard like NPR. Um, and um, that's our comment for uh, CVMC. And also, uh, FYI, that's our comment for the remaining three hospitals today. So if we have something additional to say, I'll raise my hand. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I'll open it up to public comment via the raise your hand function. Um, Ms. Sarah Davies. Thank you. Um, good morning. I <clears throat> am Sarah Davies. I'm a family physician and I'm the medical director of primary care at Central Vermont Medical Center. Um, <clears throat> we um, over, I oversee eight practices with over 62 um, clinicians um, in the Central Vermont community and caring for about 50,000 patients um, in that, um, you know, within that. Um, I am a family physician and I passionately believe that the um, key to excellent patient care excellent patient outcomes and reduction of um, healthcare spending uh, comes with a strong relationship with a physician or APP um, at the primary care level. <clears throat> so I did just wanna highlight the very vital importance of supporting and putting um, an investment into those services through our healthcare system. Um, you know, what does that mean? What do resources look like? <clears throat> Pardon me, resources in our primary care setting to help with this work include nurse managers, um, resource coordinators, dietitians, pharmacists, um, you know, medical assistants, LNAs, and, and nurses, and also the primary care mental health um, resources that Dr. Pulasi spoke about on Wednesday in her comment as well, um, all work we're doing in our medical home. I just wanted to um, give a little example about what this actually looks like on a day-to-day, -day, um, how a well-resourced um, physician can care for a patient versus 
um, not. And so uh, a physician, let's say about 1200 patients on her panel, um, a pretty um, average number of our patient panels, uh, her office gets a phone call from a concerned daughter. Um, the daughter thinks her dad's um, losing weight, shouldn't drive anymore. And then a neighbor recently told her, her that um, he was found wandering around and confused. So in a well-resourced office, a nurse manager was able to go do a home visit, um, was able to do a memory test and see that there was some moderate dementia. Also noticed there was only crackers and expired soup cans in the um, cupboard, and then the house was in disarray. And also did notice there were a few dents on the car um, bumper. So what did she do from there? She connected with a resource coordinator that helped to get um, uh, someone to help with groceries, someone to help in the home to care for and clean, uh, you know, provide some activity to, of daily living to help them keep clean and be cared for. Um, the nurse manager also reached out to the daughter to have some conversations about those difficult discussions about how long can this patient remain in the home, those discussions about driving, the advanced care planning um, discussions were started at that point by the nurse manager. Um, the resource coordinator also connected him to a um, senior living, um, senior day program, excuse me, which provides an opportunity to do woodworking, which is something this, um, her dad is passionate about, and also arranged for transport there since um, they were working to have him not drive anymore due to safety. So the primary care physician at the follow-up has all these things already in place and is able to have that meaningful conversation with some of that groundwork laid um, and really discuss then the potential causes of dementia. So doing that work that the primary care physician is trained to do as a medical professional. Um, and then, you know, also review that advanced care planning, which is so important. Um, it, you know, is, is interesting. The memory clinic has over a year wait. So, you know, this all falls on the primary care office. The other version of that story is that the primary care physician had a full day of clinic, had over 200 patient messages in the inbox and didn't get to it until she was documenting at 9 p.m. the next night, um, you know, after the kids went to bed, sees it, you know, calls and has the nurse, can you follow up this patient? The nurse was busy rooming patients, administering immunizations, um, trying to, you know, waiting on hold for a prior authorization for a diabetic med that a, another patient vitally needed. <clears throat> and so, at the end of the day, the office actually received a notification then that the patient was in the emergency room. Um, he had gotten into a fender bender and hit his head um, and didn't remember what happened. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's this happens every day. And this is the work that um, I think it's very important that we are supporting in our primary care world and investing in in our primary care world. So, you know, each each of us as a primary care physician or um, clinician goes into it with a commitment and passion to provide. Um, excellent health care and um, comprehensive care for the entire patient. But almost inevitably, we find ourselves in a position with um, the lack of uh, resources to do this work sustainably. And that compounds the physician burnout and the challenges to patient access. So again, um, thank you for the opportunity to comment and highlight the importance of investing in our primary care health networks as a way of investing in the health of our community and the health of our primary care workforce. Thank you, Ms. Davies. Um, and I, I'll just echo those comments and uh, the care board's view of the importance of primary care. We've had, I think, three or four hearings now and um, really deep dives into what can be done to really support primary care. So I'm glad that you spoke up because I share those views and I worry quite a bit about our, our dwindling number and the burnout on our primary care providers. So I appreciate that. And um, we may be in touch. This is something that we're focusing on uh, ongoing. So thank you. Um, Mr. Vincent. Good morning. Uh, just two comments to make um, uh, this morning. So one um, is uh, the same as the comment that I made on Wednesday related to the, the administrative uh, costs compared to clinical salaries costs, just to highlight again in this um, in this presentation. Um, the adjusted uh, calculation that we submitted just to highlight um, the issue that comparison is being used in this presentation, yet the benchmark data still is uh, is based on the, uh, the the data, the way that the um, is submitted to the uh, to the to the benchmark agency. So just as an example, uh, we, we did provide a couple of examples where if you adjusted these for all the organizations, um, how 
different the numbers look. Uh, we took a look at southern um, southern Maine healthcare, where in the benchmark data, the administrative salaries to clinical salaries is at 5.9 percent. But if you do the same normal normalization that we've done and provided to the Green Mountain Care Board to to create a true apples to apples comparison, that number would be 34 percent. Um, so just to give uh, an example of the, our data and the the calculation that um, that we supplied is is being compared to uh, to a benchmark that is being calculated in a very different way. Um, the second. Uh, point is just about administrative shared services um, on Wednesday. Um, the, the, the point was made that we're at a median, we're at median from a network perspective, but the focus um, has has shifted to specific areas that um, have opportunities. Um, I just want to highlight that those areas, there are reasons why we might want to make more investment in a particular shared service than another. Uh, revenue cycle, for example, if there's more investment there, it's because that we believe that there's a payoff um, at the end of the day that we have a more efficient revenue cycle operation. Uh, so the fact that we're we're using um, specific areas rather than looking at shared services in totality, um, I just wanted to to highlight that for the board as well. So thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Casey Kolb Nava. Hi, good morning. Um, uh, thank you um, to the board for taking the time to hear my public comment. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I am a physician of internal medicine. I am the director of hospital medicine uh, at Central Vermont Medical Center. Um, and then I also chair the Hospital Medicine Council for the UVM Health Network, uh, which is essentially the consortium of, of directors uh, at all of the sites within the network. Um, I, I wanted to uh, offer some comment to describe a little bit about the CVMC hospital medicine, uh, hospital based team. Um, tell you some of my observations of um, healthcare economics from where I sit uh, and and advocate um, for a well-funded uh, hospital system at CVMC as well as the broader UVM Health Network um, and our partner site, uh, partner sites in Vermont. Um, so I want to tell you that at CVMC, I, I'm part of what I think of as a very effective, efficient, and uh, lean group of uh, clinical workers. Um, that's hospital medicine, my surgical colleagues, uh, my nursing team, um, case management, uh, and, and the other um, supporting uh, staff that are um, uh, that, that really make the world go round at the hospital. Um, and I have to say that we really couldn't do our work without the support of our administrative team at CVMC. Um, I uh, I've seen over this past year with transitions uh, and vacancies in our administrative team. Um, the uh, you know I. I I hesitate to use the word chaos, but it, it really um, becomes quite an added uh, pressure when we don't have a well-funded or, or well-staffed administrative team. So it, that's really just as important for us to be doing our work in the hospital. Um, I will tell you that uh, on the clinical side, we are just as committed um, to being budget conscious uh, as, as our administrative partners. Um, and we balance that uh, with providing excellent quality and, and seeking quality improvements, um, you know, really constantly. Um, I can tell you that in the past year, I've been involved in projects uh, to decrease length of stay of our inpatients um, that I think was quite successful. Uh, and and that's, that's a value that's passed on to, um, to Vermonters, uh, um, both uh, financially as well as in terms of quality uh, of their care. Um, I've been involved in efforts to re reduce our pharmaceutical costs in the hospital, um, to reduce readmissions specifically in our heart failure population, um, and to improve patient throughput, which if you're not familiar with that term, for hospital medicine often means uh, how quickly a patient who presents to the emergency department um, who requires inpatient uh, care moves through the emergency department uh, into the hospital and, and is then um, located in their inpatient hospital uh, bed um, and then sort of extrapolating uh, how long they're still in the hospital. Um, but again, I, um, 
and, and really looking forward, I, I see that we will continue to, to work on, um, you know, not just these areas, but expanding um, focus to, again, continue to to try to provide as great a value um, and, and as high of quality as we can uh, to our patients. Um, and and I am I'm incredibly proud to work at CVMC. I think it is a, fine, a, a absolutely fantastic institution um, and and we really do quite uh, quite well for being a rural based community hospital. But unfortunately, CVMC is, is not a closed system. Um, you know, we are subject to the pressures that are affecting um, healthcare systems across the country. And, you know, these are national and regional pressures uh, related to inflation. Um, and what I see in the hospital is the increasing cost of, of staff, of getting clinical staff into the hospital. Unfortunately, being in, in rural Vermont, we have a fixed pool um, of people we can recruit into uh, our frontline nursing workforce in the hospital, as well as our um, frontline physicians. Um, I can tell you, you know, that I have seen with my own eyes our rising dependency um, on traveling nursing staff. Um, the pay for them is uh, is an absolute premium. Um, you know, I really can't uh, say that if I that if I was in their shoes, I would do anything different. But you know, I've seen um, our own local uh, nursing staff uh, effectively quit CVMC to move into traveling roles. Sometimes circling back to become travelers at CVMC itself, um, and and we pay a premium for that. Uh, I can speak to you know my own costs when I have had in this past year to seek. Uh, traveling physicians um, to fill gaps in our uh, in our coverage. What I used to be, what I used to see in terms of a premium quoted to me would be about um, a thirty percent pay raise compared to the base that I would pay the folks working for me, employed by CVMC by, by CVMC and, and UVM Health Network. And now I'm seeing um, across the board uh, pay rates for travelers that are 60 to 100% above what I'm paying the folks employed in my group. And, and that's, that is baseline. Um, so, you know, where to go to absorb those costs um, to, you know, to really kind of keep the ship afloat. Um, I, unfortunately, you know, I, I think, I will say that CBMC has done an excellent job of standing up um, programs to locally train uh, recruit and then retain um, clinical staff. I think that these programs are are putting us in a much better position than we would have been otherwise. Um, I'm excited to see them grow, uh, but I think that we're still in, in a in a place where these costs of traveling staff are going to be a part of our life for at least a few more years, um, possibly longer. Um, so you know, so what am I concerned about if if CBMC doesn't get um, the budget and rate approvals um, passed that they're asking for. I, I think, um, I, you know, I, I can see in your slide that, you know, you want to see that, that um, management is, uh, you, you know, that there's some reduction in um, management costs. Well, a lot of these things I, I kind of see as us looking around for coins uh, between the couch cushions, honestly. Um, I, what I really worry about is that we are not going to have the funding to continue to uh, staff our hospital um, with these travelers that have really become a necessary part of our workforce to keep um, to keep the ship afloat. And then what happens? Well, we have a then every day we go into work and we have a slightly reduced nursing workforce uh, on the inpatient side. Um, that means that we have to push back uh, patients that are that are acutely ill presenting to the emergency department. Um, hospital medicine is called to admit these patients. We totally agree that they need to be hospitalized. They're ill. We write admission orders for them. Um, we want to bring them into a hospital bed to a nurse that is trained uh, to take care of an inpatient. Um, but we have a you know a slight staffing shortage. Um, so that patient then boards in the emergency department, waiting for a bed to open up um, at CVMC. Um, patients, I've seen patients boarding for 12, 18, 24 hours when we get um, really high census at CBMC, and this would just be compounded. Um, those patients uh, individually um, will experience, and this is borne out in research, 
um, longer length of stays and increased rates of complications related to their hospital stay just by being boarded in the emergency department for prolonged periods. Now that's not a cost savings to me, and that certainly is not quality. Um, and not just those in individuals, but then any other patient that's presenting to the emergency department comes up against that bottleneck. We see longer wait times, um, we see uh, emergency department staff that are more harried um, because their census is higher. And this just gets pushed you know, further and further out. Um, and this is not a problem that I envision uh, being unique to CVMC. Um, CVMC is also completely dependent on UVM Medical Center having functional throughput, um, meaning that their patients are uh, getting into the hospital, getting beds, um, you know, a, akin to uh, a, a low wait time. Because we oftentimes have patients that need to transfer to that tertiary center for procedures or specialists that, that a rural community hospital just is simply not going to be able to offer at volume. Um, so again, you know, even though I, I think that CVMC is doing a fantastic job and um, we are working as hard as we can, again, to, to provide value and quality um, and to make improvements every day, uh, we're simply at the mercy of, of external forces um, that, that, that we have to be responsive to if we are going to continue to provide um, high quality care to, to our patients. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you again so much for the opportunity to make the comment. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kolpnava. Am I saying the name? Is it Kolpnava? Kolpnava? Oh, you, you got it right. Kolpnava. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Um, Dr. Ryan Clouser. Hi. Good morning. Um, Casey, you made a lot of great points. Um, I just wanted to uh, say thank you for allowing me a moment to speak. Um, my name is Ryan Clauser. I am a physician, critical care provider. I've been working in the health network since 2011 as an intensivist at the UVM Medical Center. Um, I've worked for this health network and region, the state of Vermont and upstate New York as the uh, care coordination system medical officer for our health network where I worked as a network coordinator for care for patients within our region that it uh, require transfer among hospitals, whether it's uh, Newport uh, or NDRH or CBMC, trying to coordinate the best place of care for that patient closest to home. And in that position, I really um, got a firsthand view of the thin ice our region is sitting on with regards to the ability to access care, to get care quickly, um, to even transport a patient from one hospital to another, because we're all working with limited resources and there are so many patients that need, need critical access to um, the life-saving therapies that our hospitals in this state and in our region can provide. I've also seen firsthand that while we have multiple regional tertiary care partners that we work with, their capacity to take care of people in our region has gone away. That means it's up to us as a state and a health network to provide that care. And um, actually back in April, I moved from that position in the network care coordination system to be the chief medical officer at Central Vermont Med Center. And one of the reasons I did that is because I've been working with those docs and nurses and administrators for years in my prior roles and knew how special CVMC is and the role it plays in this community. Just like all the CUNY hospitals in their local areas, the role they serve their community and how important that is. Um, we have a lot of really special, talented people here, nurses, doctors, administrators, um, Cleaners, chefs, cooks, it's its a great place to be, and it's very important and critical that we continue to be able to offer the services our communities need. As I mentioned, as regional capacity shrinks in our tertiary care centers, it's imperative that our community hospitals become more, and grow, and offer the higher level services that our patients can't get in tertiary care beds because of our throughput issues, 
uh, staffing issues, bed capacity issues, ICU capacity. We need to do everything we can to keep our patients here close to home with the right level of care um, so that we are not taking up tertiary care beds for people that could stay here. But the problem is, as we continue to run into financial challenges, our ability to grow and um, take care of these patients shrinks. And as we um, are unable to afford the cost of staff, like uh, Dr. Kolbnava mentioned, it's going to mean we're not going to be able to staff beds and patients are going to board in ERs where they're going to wait for hours to transport to either Dartmouth or UVM or even further away, which we've seen during the pandemic. Um, so I, I guess in closing, I'll just say we've got an important role to play and I understand the board's mission of trying to keep costs down. Um, we just have to do it collaboratively because we do have an important role to play and we want to grow and change and be more for these communities and these patients that we take care of. And without financial um, improvements, we can't do that. And I think cost is gonna end up going up paradoxically. And I think the level of care we provide is going to suffer and the quality of care is gonna suffer because we just don't have the resources to provide that much needed care. So thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you for commenting, uh, Dr. Clauser. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, Anna Noonan. Yes, thank you, Chair Foster. So first of all, I want to thank Drs. Um, Davis, Kolbnava, and Clauser for adding their remarks to today's hearing process. Um, you're hearing the voices of care providers um, that every day are dealing with uh, trying to balance um, the care that we're providing and the service quality we're providing, as well as the clinical care, um, at the same time optimizing the value uh, that we're trying to provide to our community. I just want to underscore how challenging these times are. This is my 42nd year in healthcare. I'm a nurse by practice um, and administrator for over 30 years. Uh, extraordinarily challenging times. The pandemic is just in the rear view mirror and um, we're grateful that the next round of vaccines are coming out to help us deal with a respiratory um, a season that is um, we're just about to enter in. I, I know that the chair um, and uh, the Green Mountain Care Board members are aware of the devastating flooding that occurred in central Vermont in uh, July. When those floods and the pandemics occur, CVMC and every hospital in the state responds. They respond to support our community. They meet the healthcare needs regardless of the cost. We are here to provide the care that our community needs. It is a balance every day to try to do that and meet the budget guidelines that we have. So I just wanna underscore how challenging that is. I'm very grateful to the community that we're serving and the support that we get from them to our clinicians, some of which appear today um, and before you, and the clinicians and support staff that every day are doing the best they can to serve our community here in central Vermont and our colleagues across the state. Central Vermont is a community hospital, but I also want to share that we take transfers in from other community hospitals that are near us. So when they're over census, they need um, higher level of care. Those patients are transferred to CVMC, and if in turn um, are also some of those patients obviously go to UVMMC as our tertiary quaternary care. Again, the first thing that's always top of mind for us is high quality care and high level of service. We also run um, a nursing home in our system. We do that at a significant loss. We do that because of some of the comments that you heard our providers share, which is we're trying to improve the flow of patients through our system here to move them from a higher level of cost to a lower level of cost um, and to make our, um, our residents safe in, within uh, the nursing home setting, which is in turn their home. So again, um, we have a number of challenges. The primary challenge is, is workforce. We've talked about this with the board in the past. I know you know of the innovative workforce programs that we've launched here. Thank goodness we started those in 2018 and we've uh, graduated students year after year, which is not just helpful to us in meeting the care needs that our community has, but it also is a game changer for them and their families. 
Um, the first cohort we graduated in that program, 60% of those students, they were, they were the first ones in their families to have any kind of post-secondary um, education. So it was a, it's a game changer for them and their families. Um, that's an investment CVMC made, despite the fact that we're, we're um, challenged with hitting our margin year after year, it's still the right investment. Um, everything we do every day to take care of our community is the right thing for us to do. Um, I just want to again say that um, regardless of the outcome of today's hearing, we're going to continue to provide the highest quality care we possibly can to the community we serve. We're privileged to be in the position to do that. And again, regardless of the decision of the Green Mountain Care Board, we're going to strive to continue to meet our mission to be central to our community and to care for our community for their lifetime. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Noonan. Um, from board comments, it sounds like there wasn't or there may not be consensus on a higher or lower charge. Um, so I think we probably need a roll call vote, Mr. McCracken. Hmm. Um, I don't think the motion has been um, oh, made. Oh, right. I'm sorry. Sorry. <clears throat> I'll make the motion. Um, I support this. I, I move to approve the Central Vermont Medical Center's budget as modified hereby the 14.4% increase from fiscal year 22 actual to fiscal year 24 budgeted MPR FPP reduced from 21.4, a 5.0% charge increase from fiscal year 23 to 24 reduced from 10.0 and subject to the standard budget conditions as approved by the board and an additional condition that CVMC shall submit to the board within three months a plan addressing CVMC's efforts to reduce costs and control overall expense growth in connection with, among other things, information technology, human resources management, and revenue cycle management. Further, CVMC is required to meet monthly with board staff for monitoring purposes. I'll second. Second. Is there additional board discussion? I had one other comment, which is <clears throat> I, this condition to me is sort of more of a network wide condition and just having it consistent um, makes sense to me. It's not really, uh, I think it makes more sense for it to be just for each of the hospitals since they are submitted one submission. I think it makes more sense to have, have a uniform. Um, uh, Mr. McCracken, if you could take the roll call, please. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Chair Foster. I'll take the roll call in alphabetical order, uh, Member Holmes. Yes. Member Lunge. Yes. Uh, Member Walsh. No. And Chair Foster. Yes. <clears throat> um, the motion is approved. And thank you everyone from CVMC for commenting and for your um, presentation to us a couple of weeks ago, or maybe almost a month ago now. Um, we'll move on next to the Porter Medical Center presentation by Director Lindbergh. Thank you. Um, so here we see the summary of Porter Medical Center. Uh, we see that there have not uh, been uh, adjustments to the net revenue, uh, patient revenue in the submissions uh, for quite some time, all those uh, few tweaks back in fiscal year 18. Uh, there were some adjustments to change in charge, however, in both fiscal years, 21 and 22. Um, and we see here uh, the reliant, the, if you weight the increase in charge by the commercial payer mix, uh, that is a, a big jump in fiscal year 23 as approved, um, but levels out over the two years. Um, seeing some operating results persisting um, in terms of actual to budget and declining uh, revenue in fiscal year 21 and 22, but um, a significant uh, increase in fiscal year 23 year to date. Expense factors, uh, the compensation per FTE growth is at 1.2%, which is fifth lowest among Vermont hospitals. Utilization is just above the benchmark at the sixth highest among Vermont hospitals. 
pharmaceutical expenses within benchmark are, are as our cost inflation, uh, both uh, at the fifth position uh, in the comparison Vermont Hospital Group. And uh, when we uh, look at how their budget is performing uh, in fiscal year 23, we see that they are above budget on operating margin, operating a bit of margin and total margin. Uh, days cash on hand are still below uh, what is uh, budgeted. Um, however, uh, in testimony in the hearing, uh, we found out that that the days cash on hand at the hospital level is not maybe not uh, as critical to the network as what that looks like at the network level. So, um, but seeing this above 100 is uh, encouraging. Probably would ideally like to see it a bit higher. Um, and when we scroll down to uh, the administrative costs. So again, uh, we've talked about this. We did adjust this, but did not adjust all the hospitals with the method methodology requested by the UVM Health Network. So uh, one of those situations where it's a uh, tough comparison, but when we do apply the adjustment, um, the admin cost ratio goes from 13.6% to 29.25%, which would be the 11th, 11th highest among Vermont hospitals. Um, and uh, that rank is wrong. I apologize. Uh, that's reversed. Uh, so that would be one minus eight, um, which I don't do math in my head. Apologies. Uh, and what? It'll be quicker to go to the budget tool. It just occurred to me, so that we can see. Uh, what this will be corrected to right now. <clears throat> um, so that would be, yeah, at the right near the 75th percentile. So uh, apologies for that. Uh, and uh, oh, that was CBMC, golly. <clears throat> Order is going to be up here. So the admin to clinical ratio uh, will be, yeah, probably closer to that uh, 30th percentile. So we'll get that fixed up. Uh, and then uh, at uh, $12,000 per uh, for CMI adjusted uh, cost per Medicare discharge, that's uh, right in the middle of the pack among Vermont hospitals and uh, 42nd uh, percentile. So within the interquartile range among critical access hospitals. Uh, we see here uh, that the cost coverage uh, is um, within the interquartile range um, and uh, for both the cost per discharge as well as the cost coverage and standardized price on the inpatient side. On the outpatient side, we see um, that they are near um, the 25th percentile up until fiscal year 20 where they start to get creeping towards the middle of that range and near getting near to the um, 75th percentile in fiscal year 22. Um, however, despite that, um, we see uh, actually a decline in cost coverage over that time period. So that in, suggests that uh, there's probably more intensive services being provided in the outpatient setting during this time period. However, the standardized price through 2020 was within the interquartile range. So just uh, might take some time for some of this to catch up to that RAND analysis. Um, so I can move over to the slide deck. <clears throat> oh, do it this way. All right, are we seeing the budget request here? Okay, great. Um, so for Porter, uh, the approved uh, increase for, for the fiscal year 23 NPR budget was 5.8%. The request uh, for 24 was an additional 8.3 for an overall growth of 28.4%. Um, and when we look at the commercial of a change in commercial effective rate, uh, they were granted 11.5% last year and requested an additional 6.9% this year for a two-year growth rate of 184 if we're going to constrain that to 7% growth over two years, the budget uh, would have to reduce uh, by $3 million and involve a negative 4.5% change in commercial effective rate. Holding them to inflation is a $2 million adjustment uh, to NPR and would keep them at 14.6 across the two years. 
Um, so uh, the expense growth is uh, the highest among Vermont hospitals at 17.8%. Uh, a lot of that has to do with utilization and the ability for the network to um, find capacity at Porter, particularly related to orthopedics. Uh, that proportion of admin and general salaries we've talked about quite a bit, but among critical access hospitals, uh, when it's only adjusted uh, for Porter, they would be at the 92nd percentile. Uh, the CMI adjusted costs per Medicare discharge is uh, near median at 58th percentile, and both standardized price for inpatient and outpatient is at or near or below median. Um, and this is a hospital that has a low reliance on charge, uh, relatively speaking, but for the commercial effective rate was at the 38th percentile uh, over the past five years and 8th percentile in the past 10 years. Um, of note that, again, uh, we are outperforming uh, the um, budgeted rates here. So the budget was an 8% margin. We're at 11. Um, my understanding is that part of that uh, margin is helpful in uh, supporting Helen Porter Nursing Home. Um, and I'm also uh, under the impression that hopefully some of those rates have been uh, increased and enhanced with the rebase that happened in July from our partners at Medicaid. So um, hoping that they'll be able to find uh, more direct mechanisms for that. As far as the opportunity for shared administrative consideration, um, again, same analysis if we compare it to that median uh, with their share, um, an opportunity potential of uh, about $6 million to get to median. So the staff recommendation would be to approve the NPR as budgeted um, and not adjust that at the 28.4%, but uh, do adjust the change in charge down from five to inflation at 3.1% and to the earlier points include the kind of network wide condition for additional reporting. Um, our rationale being that, you know, the operating results are, are pretty um, favorable in comparison to budget and that they are showing um, expense growth costs and admin to clinical salaries above the 75th percentile and seeing this opportunity to continue kind of addressing access needs across the UVM Health Network. Hopefully that wasn't too fast. Chair Foster, back to you. No, thank you for being mindful of the time. Um, board members? Any comments or questions? Being mindful of the time, I will uh, just simply say I'm supportive of the staff recommendation. I'm also supportive. I'd like to make a quick comment, though. I'm concerned about the rapid expense growth and the admin clinical ratio at the 92nd percentile. Um, on the admin clinical ratio and cost reports, organizations complete those forms, as well as um, audited forms, any type of form that is required, organizations have discretion as they follow the rules with the forms. And they work to fulfill to fill out those forms to their advantage. Right? What goes into a certain line, how they calculate it, that's thought of deeply by several people in every organization. So it doesn't make sense to apply one hospital's technique to all, even unaffiliated hospitals. They may disagree with that technique because it may affect them in some other way that we're not aware of. A facility may, an enterprise may choose a single approach for a network or keep it individualized. The mothership may look better with one technique or affiliates may look better with another, but there's either a network that uses the same approach across all facilities or there are individual facilities. It's not okay to go back and forth and to try to have it both ways. The general distribution from the cost reports tends to stand because every facility is maximizing the use of the cost report for itself. And with this particular network, we double check the admin cost data using an additional uh, set of data supplied by the network, their Centillus data. And the findings of excessive admin expenses stands. So the question remains, where are the savings from the shared services? That's something that I think we need to keep following in years to come. They've been promised since 2015, 2016, and they've yet to materialize while the administrative layer and the executive salaries have continued to grow. So back to you, Chair Foster. Um, thank you, Member Holmes. 
Yeah, I guess I don't have much too much to add in the interest of time. I'll just say that I, in my view, Porter has benefited from high margins over the past few years and is expecting, you know, better than uh, expected performance this year. Um, I'm happy to hear that Helen Porter had a recent rate bump, uh, which should help that bottom line if that's accurate. Uh, again, as a critical access hospital, Porter will get cost-based reimbursement from Medicare, so there's less need in particular for this hospital for higher than inflation commercial rate increases given their performance uh, and their recent margins. So I support the staff recommendation here. Uh, it's not a hospital that has aspirational budgeting. Um, there are access issues in the area, so I think there's room to increase utilization and meet the projected NPR, but not through uh, rate, only through rate. So I support the motion. I also support the motion. Um, healthcare advocate, do you have anything in addition to your um, comment that you've made for the other network hospitals? No additional comment, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. And um, just I'll open up to public comment, but um, we only have till 11 today. So we'll, you know, I want to give adequate time to the other hospitals we have. Um, Ms. Withers, Natasha Withers. Hi, thanks so much for allowing me to do public comment today. My name is Natasha Withers. I'm a family physician at Porter Medical Center. I also serve as Associate Chief Medical Officer and Associate Vice President for Population Health for the UVM Health Network. It's been my great honor to serve in these leadership roles and it's been part of the change that way we're delivering healthcare at the UVM Health Network. After residency, I had the privilege of helping build an innovative primary care model, one that broke the mold on the traditional primary care experience. I learned a lot through this. After five years in New York City, my family was ready to move to our forever home in Vermont. When I arrived at Porter, I knew I was home. I saw the passion that people had for our community hospital, the dedication they put into making it a great place to work and provide care for our friends, neighbors, and colleagues. I saw amazingly talented people leading the way on healthcare delivery, and I was excited to jump in and join them. When Porter joined the UVM Health Network, our small community hospital grew to be surrounded by more amazing, talented people through Vermont and Northern New York. When I saw the more colleagues were constantly striving to be better, to be better for our patients, our community, and each other. It is through this collaboration that we have been able to begin our journey to break the mold on care delivery, acknowledging that there is a better way to deliver primary health care, a model that moves away from reactionary crisis management to proactive preventative care. We do this by changing our care delivery model and building a multidisciplinary team to provide comprehensive care with wraparound support services for our patients, a team that includes care managers, ambulatory pharmacists, mental health professionals, health educators, and more. A model that acknowledges that the care is more than a transactional interaction, but rather an ongoing relationship with our patients and our families. One that is set up to be the support of our, our patient's life journey. One that is well positioned to provide unique customized health care for our patients, through the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. We are their medical home. We have spent the last two years discussing learning, asking questions, challenging, and innovating so that we can successfully set up a primary care system that offers our patients the right care at the right time at the right place. We are about to take the first big step in this journey. We are actively building the infrastructure and hiring the staff to make this a reality. We are expanding our care teams to improve access, recruiting the very best people, and working to retain their talent by creating an innovative, supportive, goal-oriented place to work. There has never been a more critical time to support primary care in these efforts than now. This change takes a significant financial investment, one that needs to be properly funded to move dreams into reality. I have listened to the discussions and the comments this week around access, the importance of primary care, and the need to be focused on health. I could not agree more. I wake up every morning and look forward to contributing to the change we need to make to achieve our goals. We at Porter and the UVM Health Network want to be that change. We want to continue to lead the way in providing high value care and primary care transformation. I ask you to join us on this journey by allowing us the funding we need to do the next right thing. Thank you very much for allowing me to comment. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, 
Mr. Vincent. Just a really quick comment in the interest of time um, that we, we definitely very much look forward to working with the board on the cost comparisons. I think with what member Walsh highlights, there is um, uh, the way that organizations uh, complete cost reports. There's great variability. Um, our point is, I think there is a way to normalize that data to, to create a true apples to apples comparison. So we look forward to working with with the board on that effort uh, going. Forward. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comment? OK, um, I move to approve Porter Hospital's budget as modified hereby with a 28.4% increase from fiscal year 22 actual to fiscal year 24 budgeted NPR FPP, a 3.1% charge increase from fiscal year 23 to 24 reduced from 5.0 and subject to the standard budget conditions as approved by the board an additional condition that Porter shall submit to the board within three months, a plan addressing Porter's efforts to reduce costs and control overall expense growth in connection with, among other things, information technology, human resources, management, and revenue cycle management. Further, Porter is required to meet monthly with board staff for monitoring purposes. I'll second. Is there any additional board discussion? Um, I. I think we, uh, Mr. McCracken, do we need a roll call on this one? No, okay. All those in um, favor, please say, I got some head nods there. I think we're okay. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. The vote carries unanimously um, for, sorry, not unanimously, four, four to zero, because Merman's abstaining. Okay. Um, we'll take a five minute break and come back um, with Dr. Merman. Thank you. All right, we will resume um, our hearing and I'll turn it back to Director Lindbergh and the team. Thank you very much. Um, so the penultimate hospital we have to deliberate on is Copley. Uh, so as you can see, there's been um, some adjustments to their uh, both NPR and commercial NPR over time. Uh, some of them uh, pretty noticeable, like the negative 17.7% in fiscal year 21. Uh, we also see that uh, there's been adjustments to operating expenses and their change in charge. Uh, we do uh, see that for a critical access hospital, um, a relatively high uh, commercial uh, weight in that payer mix. So see that reflected in uh, last year's rate, which was uh, approved at 12% charge increase. Um, Copley was unique in that uh, its actuals uh, were kept relatively whole uh, through the pandemic, but uh, fiscal year 23 is when uh, they were hit pretty hard um, in terms of the recovery. Uh, the labor expense growth uh, per FTE at 17.8% is the 13th highest among Vermont hospitals. So just a bit above the median, uh, but it seems to be reflecting Mostly the provider transfers and other expansion that Copley testified to in their hearing related to access um, and utilization at 2.4% is fourth highest, um, but seeing some impressive gains there as they work to continually optimize, uh, particularly their orthopedic uh, process. Uh, the, this is a hospital that um, has some financial challenges in the current fiscal year. Um, their operating margin is negative 0.7 uh, from one that was budgeted at 1.6. The budget as submitted has a 3% margin, so that's a you know relatively high increase in one year for margin. Um, but we do see the operating a bit of margin at 3%, uh, also below budget, and total margin at negative 0.6 is below budget. Um, that low amount of days cash on hand is something that uh, is concerning to me as a financial regulator. Um, and seeing uh, the age of plant where it is is, uh, you know, not uh, in line with other Vermont hospitals. Uh, so not uh, quite as, uh, you know, uh, not we've seen higher values among Vermont hospitals with the median at uh, 16 years. Uh, for the ratio of administrative and general salaries to clinical salaries, uh, they were the uh, lowest in, for Vermont, according to the fiscal year 22 pro, uh, cost reports at 16.4%. Uh, 
uh, interesting to me that um, the best Vermont hospital is still the 42nd percentile uh, among the comparators. So just, uh, I think, a testament to the small hospitals that we have in Vermont. Um, also see a relatively low um, average cost per Medicare discharge at uh, $10,672. It's the fourth lowest uh, among Vermont hospitals, and it just happens to be at the same relative ranking among its peers at the 42nd percentile. Uh, as far as the standardized prices, uh, the commercial cost per discharge, rather, we see that uh, Copley uh, in fiscal year 22 was above the 25th percentile, so uh, relatively low cost near to that, but also um, quite low cost coverage for those services at 70%. Um, and see their standardized price of 18,000 is uh, in the middle of the mix there. Uh, on the outpatient side, seeing a little bit more favorable cost coverage, uh, but also a rather substantial bump from fiscal year 21 to 22. So I think some of the recent uh, rate decisions uh, are starting to uh, uh, materialize in Copley's operating results. But back in 2020, they were below the 25th percentile uh, in the RAND study. Uh, so just a moment to transition back to the slide deck. All right. Seeing the budget request before you. Okay, wonderful. So uh, one uh, important note about this is uh, we did adjust uh, some of these results. Uh, so Copley had initially presented a provider transfer for the additional provider they're having in their budget uh, for fiscal year 24 that was unanticipated. Um, given the way that the provider transfer is designed to work, uh, I actually see that more akin to what Southwestern was explaining in terms of improving access. And um, given that they are a low cost, efficient, um, high quality provider for those services, um, I think it's a warranted increase in NPR, but I think it should be reflected in the increase and not uh, kind of taken away uh, through a provider transfer lens. Uh, I think the other two services uh, for the provider transfer make sense, but it was just the orthopedic uh, provider that I think should be accounted for in the budget increase. So when you do that, um, the increase from fiscal year 22 to 24 as submitted is 20 million, which is a 21.3% increase. Uh, the 12% charge approved last year and coupled with the 15% requested la uh, this year uh, would be a 27% growth rate. If we're going to try to constrain that to 7% uh, over the two years, it would be a negative 5% charge increase this year. And if we were to constrain the growth from fiscal year 23 projected to the 24 budget, it would be 15.1% over the two years. Um, so again, what, after we make that adjustment uh, for the non-provider transfer, the expense growth goes up to the, goes up to 12.1%, which is the 69th percentile among Vermont hospitals. Um, however, again, the lowest uh, rate of uh, admin and general salaries, the so clinical salaries in Vermont in the 46, 42nd percentile among its peers, same comparative uh, place for cost per Medicare discharge, uh, and those inpatient and outpatient prices uh, quite, uh, quite low. And again, that stops at 2020, so some of that catch up is probably going to start coming through in future years. Um, they have had um, gener uh, the, the highest kind of rate increases in the past five years to that point. Um, and in the past 10 years, it's been the eighth percentile among Vermont hospitals. Um, we do have some concerns about that margin being under budget. Um, that's driven primarily by the higher than budgeted salary benefit and contractual expenses. So part of that is the price of expansion and increasing access. So just an important point as we think about some of these budgets and, and why they grow. It's not always for one reason. So the upshot is that we would approve, uh, staff would recommend approving that NPR and FPP growth at, as budgeted um, after adjusting for the provider transfer um, at 21.3%, but adjust the change in charge from 15% down to eight. Um, the rationale being the historical low reliance on rate increases um, balanced with the relatively larger increases in recent years. Um, they're at or below median uh, admin to clinical ratio in costs and standardized price. Um, and this also, you know, helps bring them in line with peers over the two year period that these budgets are designed uh, to review. So with that, I'll turn it to you, Chair Foster. 
Thank you. Um, I'll start with Dr. Merman. If he has any comments or questions. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, uh, Owen. Um, I, I, I think Copley is a, a hospital that I think is a little bit challenging to evaluate for a couple of reasons. One is their uh, their commercial prices have been so low for so long. At least it appears that way through the RAND pricing and going back to the five years prior to that with pretty low rate increases. And so I think even with the RAND pricing, the RAND price from 2020, if we look at the the increases since then, they're still fairly low. Um, but they're also really efficient. And so they've I think they've been able to to be a, a very efficient operating hospital with high quality in the context of these low prices. So some of my thoughts on this are that um, uh, let's see other than low prices, sorry, I'm just reading through my notes here. They also have very low, they have low outpatient prices and low inpatient prices. And I think those prices have taken a while to come back. And I don't think the rate increases that they've had over the recent years get them back to their peers. Um, they also have the low administrative clinical salaries. Um, they have a low, one of the lower adjusted CMI, adjusted cost per discharge. Um, that said, you know, uh, Copley's utilization seems to be trending up. They're adding multiple providers. I think their utilization will help them increase their revenue this year. So I don't think that all their revenue gap needs to be made up for in uh, in rate, and that uh, their increased utilization I think is maybe it may be above what they're uh, expecting. Um, so I think that looking at them in the context of one and two year inflation is a little challenging given their low prices over time. So I'm comfortable going over the one and two year uh, medical inflation and going with the staff recommendation of 8%. Um, I, don't, I don't think that the request of 15% is quite supported in the submission and from the other uh, benchmarks that we're reviewing. So I'm comfortable with this uh, staff recommendation. Member Lunch? I really don't have anything to add, so I'll just note that I'm also supportive of the staff recommendation. Member Walsh? Um, I can be comfortable with this. I um, did note in the presentation from Copley, they justified um, their uh, somewhat aggressive raising of prices due to come in, trying to come in line with local peers. but I. It reminded me, though, that there's great value in being a high reliability organization that can safely deliver outstanding outcomes and high quality at low prices. And a race to match local prices is not sustainable for Vermonters as a whole. So I hope that um, I hope that they can continue to focus on being a high quality, safe great outcome, low price organization. Member Holmes? Yep, um, I can support the staff recommendation here. This has been a high performing, low cost, low price hospital. Um, I do think that given the relatively high charge increases over the past few years that they may no longer be at the bottom of the pack. I think the RAND data will be updated soon. Um, and we may see an increase in the percentile rank of Copley on standardized price, but uh, they have been a low price, low cost hospital. Uh, as a critical access hospital, they are going to get cost based reimbursement from Medicare. So I didn't see in the submission a, a justification for a 27% increase in charge over two years. Uh, but I can support the staff's recommendation here. Days cash on hand are low. Compared to the median in Vermont, there are significant capital improvements needed. Um, and so this higher than inflationary rate should support some of that necessary investment. So I support um, this uh, proposal. Motion. Okay. Um, I don't have much. I have a high degree of confidence in Copley. Um, I think they are a high performer and I view the rate increase as an investment in that performance. And I do want to give additional resources to places that can perform high. And Copley has. And so I support this 
uh, large increase. I'll note, I think to date, this is the largest rate increase that's been approved by the board. And from my notes, it looks like it will be the, of the ones we've done so far, I think it'll be the second highest overall rate increase over two years. I think Rutland was higher and they were the ones that came in um, uh, under the budgetary guidance. So of the non-budgetary guidance hospitals, I think this is the single highest one year increase so far the board has granted and the second highest in two years. And I think that is reflective of what we've seen in the historical performance. So I also support it as an investment in a hospital that's doing quite well for its community and I hope it continues. Um, so I will open it up to the healthcare advocate if they have anything. I don't see their hand raised. Uh, Mr. Fisher. No further comment, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll open it to public comment. And uh, I see Mr. Wooden's hand is raised. He is the CEO, Joseph Wooden. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Um, just a couple of comments. I really appreciate all the work that you guys do and have been doing for many years. This is probably one of the more gamey years for discussions about looking at hospitals and rates. And I know you guys are trying to objectively stay strong and I appreciate that. And I think you're doing a very good job. We don't give you enough accolades or maybe we're not sincere, but I really do appreciate that this is tough stuff and we're all trying to figure it out. We're all Vermonters, we're trying to get to data that helps us. So um, I don't have any um, written remarks, of course, but uh, just a couple of things I wanna say. We do provide excellent care at a very low cost and I can appreciate the, the comments and accolades, but um, our prices, it's funny these words, you know, our, our cost, our prices, what we charge, they have been so low for so many years and uh, I've been a CEO in Vermont since 99. So I have data going back almost 25 years, but we, we, we're never really catching up. So when we get 8% and other people get 4%, but their number is so high, 4% of $200 charge versus 8% for our $40 charge, it doesn't work. I can't seem to make it work. I have been here four years next month, and I'm really trying to figure out what is the issue that makes a specialty, for the most part, center of excellence orthopedics hospital. And we appreciate those labels and accolades that you guys give us. And people do come to us and we have amazingly good care and we get staff who really sincerely give up themselves uh, with great empathy and kindness, as well as clinicians who just do an amazing job and our surgeons are just fantastic. But I can't seem to make it work. I don't know how to make it work. I mean, I'm really trying to be thoughtful, having worked in four hospitals in Vermont, so much so that I'm going to actually do something that is, I'm going to ask you if you can treat us like the UVM network and meet with us monthly and try to help me figure this out because I don't know the answer. Uh, we we're managing expenses. We're trying to ask people to cross train. We're doing everything possible, but when our rates continue to be so low. When you say, in essence, like, well, you'll make it up on volume. I'm I'm losing money every time I do this. If I if this year I'm going to have a negative operating margin, next year I'm going to have a budgeted negative operating margin. That'll be nine years in a row of negative operating margin, except one year when I've had relief from the feds because of COVID. But if I didn't have that, I would have had a negative 1.2 percent operating margin. Nine years of a negative operating margin doesn't work. Volume, when I do more volume, I'm still losing money. And so, you know, may, maybe there are folks out there that thinks we should join the UVM network or close, close the doors, you know, go into bankruptcy, much like Springfield. I don't think those are a good idea for the state of Vermont. I think the prices of all our services will go up, but I'm really, just emotionally imploring that I need some help. I'm not angry, but I'd love some help. I'd love Green Mountain Care Board or consultants that you might use help me understand what we're doing because the the data that I've shown that I showed in the presentation, I mean, some of the highest hospitals in terms of their charges are like 900% higher. Some are 700%, you, you, you saw the charge data that I showed, but you're, 
you're, you're I'm sort of saying if you could just give me average, I'm not even looking for, you know, compensation or, you know, past sins that haven't been made up for for 20 plus years. Even if you just gave me average, what the Vermont hospitals have for charges, that that constitutes about a 40 to 50 percent increase in all of my rates. Just want you to sort of think about that. And I know Sarah has our data, I've given our data. You can look at us. I mean, I feel like we're just in a unique situation where I can never catch up. And then when you say, well, that's a good rate increase, that should help you. It kind of does and it doesn't because everybody else has gone up and I'm still sort of managing way behind. So I apologize for being emotional and explaining my plea. I do want to get some help and I would love you guys to maybe dive into what we're doing here because we do provide excellent care. We have a waiting list on so many services, which is great. People, people from far and wide come to us and our staff are extraordinary. And it's my job to make sure that we're giving them a fighting chance to continue with a culture and a delivery model. So I appreciate uh, all that you do. I, I don't look at five or 10 years. The past five years, yeah, we've got the, you know, you, data is interesting. <laughs> my background is, uh, you know, data analysis like you wouldn't believe. Um, so, yeah, if you look at the past five years, you say, well, you've got the highest increase in the past five years. It still, it does nothing, it does nothing. If you look at the past 10 years, 15, 20 years, we are so pathetically low in our increases. So, you know, it, 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 it's a systemic issue. It's sort of generational and I'm, I'm doing the best I can. And I love this place and I think we provide good care, but I'm gonna have to maybe ask for some help and help us figure this out. Cause, cause this reduction is a, $6.5 million swing in the operating margin. So I'm budgeting a negative $2.8 million loss. And if we come up with a negative $2.8 million loss as the goal, hope that you meet that and don't lose more. I just think we're sending the wrong message to sort of the wrong player, but I'm not telling you I have an answer. I have a lot of ideas though, and I don't have a lot of people that appreciate them and that's fine. I don't mind being alone. A couple of ideas, which I think would be helpful for you folks, is that I have heard repeatedly discrepancies in data, how data is reported, how it's used, how it's calculated. I've brought this up before. I think the state ought to go with a single auditor. I think you ought to mandate that we have a single audit firm, a national firm, so that when we look at everything from free care or how you're calculating compensation, maybe benefits, find retirement plans, whatever you're looking at. Every it, it, So many times during this hearing, you guys have come across people saying, well, it's a little different. We do it this way. We don't do that. We, you know, we ask our auditors to do studies for us. They're great. We use a national firm. I think if you're going to do this process of overlooking this expensive resource in these budgets, you really got to make sure that the data you're looking at is not discussed in a way that always gets discounted or should be adjusted. So that's just one suggestion. My second one would be streamline the payer systems with regards to Medicaid and commercial, which we have control over, so that we are more like Medicare, so that we can really start to look at efficiencies, so that there's a lot of things we could do. Some people might not like these ideas. <laughs> that's fine, but uh, I want you guys to do a better job and have beta better data too. I mean, we're all in this together. It's not like I'm angry with you guys. You guys have a really difficult job, very difficult job, and I think you're doing a good job at it. So I'm just petitioning if I can get some help over this next year, that would be great. But thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wooden. And your comment about asking for a monthly meeting really struck me and is part of why I made a comment about how we had a lot of confidence in the leadership because of the collaborative approach you've taken. Um, so I appreciate that comment. It's sort of a unique thinking and perspective because I think other times people don't feel that way. Um, we are here to help and make every hospital as sound as we can. So thank you for recognizing that and recognizing that we're trying to support hospitals as much as we can um, while balancing all the other considerations we have. Um, so, so thank you for the collaborative approach with us. I, I really appreciate it and for your suggestions. Um, we will talk here at the board and make sure that any resources we have, whether it's our talented team 
or our contractors are here to do anything they can to help solve some of these problems. Um, any other public comment? Okay. Um, I will move to approve Copley Hospital's budget as modified hereby with a 21.3% increase from fiscal year 22 actual to fiscal year 24 budgeted NPR FPP. An 8% charge increase from fiscal year 23 to 24, reduced from 15, and subject to the standard budget conditions as approved by the board. Second. Any additional board discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, motion carries unanimously. And I think the final hospital we have is Northeastern. <clears throat> That's right. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, Northeastern uh, Vermont, <clears throat> pardon me, Regional Hospital has had some minor adjustments in uh, fiscal years 18 to 20 and hasn't had their budget adjusted uh, since fiscal year 21. Uh, they also uh, had a relatively high uh, request and charge increase for fiscal year uh, 23 to 24, um, which uh, does have a uh, higher weight uh, in on the commercial rate payers uh, in these past couple of years. Uh, and then highlighting here that <clears throat> they're working hard about uh, on their cost per FTE. Uh, some significant efforts to kind of move uh, efforts that were designed to um, enhance payment related to COVID to bring them in-house and make them more sustainable on a go-forward basis. So um, seeing their uh, downward adjustment is the lowest among Vermont hospitals. Uh, the utilization is a bit above benchmark um, and their cost inflation is the lowest uh, reported among Vermont hospitals. Uh, their year-to-date um, performance is above the budget. Uh, they had only budgeted a 0.2 margin last year, and they're at 1.1, uh, with a total margin at three over the 0.4 budgeted. But uh, again, seeing uh, some concerning days cash on hand at this facility. As far as uh, the admin, administrative, and general clinical ratio of administrative and general salaries to clinical salaries at 21%. They were the fourth highest among Vermont hospitals with a 46th uh, percentile among their comparators and their co average cost per Medicare discharge after adjusting for CMI was at $13,224 right in the middle of the pack among Vermont hospitals and at the 75th per for 71st percentile among their comparators. Uh, when we look at their commercial cost per discharge, uh, they are near the 25th percentile and had uh, quite a stretch there of relatively low uh, com commercial cost coverage. Uh, that's just above or at cost now uh, in fiscal year 22. Um, and we do see their standardized price at the 75th percentile um, as of 2020. Um, on the outpatient side, uh, seeing a little bit of a jump in fiscal year 22, um, or I'm sorry, fiscal year 21, which was carried forward to 22, um, but still, despite that, still at 200% um, of uh, the commercial cost coverage, so that's above the 75th percentile, so an indicator of relatively high commercial price, um, and see the standardized price at outpatient also uh, right at that 75th percentile. Uh, so, moving back to our other material. So here we see that um, the requested NPR last year went up, our approved NPR went up by 4.2%, seeing a more substantial growth uh, requested for fiscal year 24 at 11.4% for 16.3% over the two years. That's on the kind of mid to lower side of the request over the two years, but we do see um, a, a relatively higher reliance on the change in charge to get there uh, with the 15% increase for fiscal year 24 that puts them at 25.8% over the two years. If we were gonna hold that to the 7%, that's a pretty substantial uh, reduction at 16% of their NPR and a negative 3.8% rate increase this or chart change in charge increase. 
um, and just holding them to 3.1% over uh, fiscal year 23 projected would be a 10% cut to NPR for 13.9% over the two years. Um, their expense growth at 14.6 is at the 85th percentile uh, among Vermont hospitals. As we discussed, they're near median for the admin to general salaries and near the 75th percentile on both the costs and standardized prices on the, in, on the inpatient and outpatient settings. Um, their five-year um, reliance on charge is at the 38th percentile at um, just under 24% and the longer term 10-year right at median at 46.5%. Um, so they are outperforming their budget, primarily driven by higher than budgeted NPR and FPP, um, but at 1%, um, not, a, not a ton of wiggle room in that margin. Um, ideally, would like to see that near you know, 3% uh, for a nonprofit hospital. Um, this is probably the hardest recommendation that uh, we've grappled with as staff. Um, so what where we landed in consultation uh, individually with board members is adjusting the NPR, NPR growth from 16.3 to 9% with a commiserate adjustment to their operating expenses and adjusting that charge from 15% to 8%. Um, is interest in the additional um, condition about monthly reporting um, to submit three months, the improvement plan addressing areas of particular concern. The rationale here is trying to, you know, try to develop some equitable way to look at it, the charge growth um, across all our hospitals. Acknowledgement of those costs and standardized prices being toward the upper end of the, the range and uh, the relatively high expense growth. Um, I will note that this is a hospital that's trying to partner and work with peers and uh, you know kind of reform in a in a difficult way and I, I just uh, this is a hard recommendation that's a substantial change uh, to their budget um, so just uh, we'll turn it back to you with that note. Okay, thank you. Um, we can go in the same order for board comment or questions, starting with Dr. Merman. Uh, thanks. Um, I agree. I think this is one of the hardest budgets to to review and to understand how to to work with. Um, NVRH, I think, is a critically important hospital that provides healthcare services to one of the most rural and underserved regions in Vermont. Uh, there's really few other healthcare options in this region, along with North Country. Uh, they they together provide healthcare services for are arguably one of the most economic disadvantages in the state with transportation difficulties and really complex social needs in their community. Um, I know that NVRH has really done exceptionally well at working with community partners through blueprint programs now for a decade. Um, the, the challenge I think with NVRH is that they do have these very high standard prices. Um, and have had just below uh, you know, average cumulative rate increases over the last five years. So it, it, it puts sort of a complex lens on this large ask. Um, that said, they have had lower rate increases than many other hospitals. And I, I, I saw that they're lower than Rutland. This is prior to this year, Rutland, CVMC, Brattleboro, EVMMC, Copley, North Country, and Porter. So they're, they're, they're kind of in the middle for the five years coming into today or this year. Um, I'm very concerned about their relatively low days cash on hand. Um, it appears they have a reasonably solid margin so far this year. Um, I, I guess I, I would like to hear other board members' thoughts on this 8% charge before uh, committing to a position on it. Member Lunch. My apologies, I have some dog chaos happening. So uh, if you hit, hear dogs in the background, I'm sorry. Um, I agree with Member Merman, this is a very tough budget. Um, I do appreciate all St. Johnsbury's and NVRH's commitment to their community partners. Uh, we've seen, as, as Member Merman mentioned, very 
strong partnership there. Um, but I am concerned about the high commercial price given the socioeconomic demographics in the region and um, how tough that must be on the community. So, um, you know, I won't say this isn't, it hasn't been an easy choice, but I do, I will support the staff recommendation. Um, similar to my colleagues, this is a um, difficult decision. I think uh, Member Lunge um, spoke to the charge increase and the socioeconomic status of the region. Wages across Vermont have gone up um, about 8% um, across the state, if you look it up. But that's probably not the case in St. J. And so um, in future years, trying to get some more um, neighborhood level uh, data on things like wage increases could be helpful. Um, the, the continued rapid growth in costs and prices um, is becoming more unaffordable for Vermonters. And the inability to pay for health care makes for an unsustainable future for organizations that deliver care. So I'm very concerned about the 8%. Um, having said that, um, I think Sarah's and her team's analysis here, um, I know that she's struggled, they've struggled with this type of um, situation, and um, I can uh, approve this motion as suggested. So. So thanks uh, to the team again for the analysis. I agree with my colleagues' points already. This is a tough one. Um, and I think it's a significant adjustment to one of the critical hospitals in our state. But relative to the peers, it's a high cost, high priced hospital already. And I think it's very difficult to find compelling evidence to support a 26% increase in charge over two years, particularly as others have mentioned, given the socioeconomic demographics of, of that region of the state. Um, but similar to Copley, uh, I worry about the relatively low days cash on hand. Um, so I think an 8% change in charge is, is warranted. Um, I, you know, I think this hospital needs to get on a on a more sustainable path that does not rely so much on high commercial rate increases. Um, they are getting, you know, uh, cost based reimbursement from Medicare, so that's important to remember. So I think the improvement plan might help, and I think working with this hospital and thinking through some of the shared service opportunities that they are working with with other hospitals in the state. Um, and I think, you know, it'll be fruitful for this hospital to think about, you know, a zero budgeting approach for next year to really see if there's any other opportunities for cost savings. And I look forward to being able to work, work with this hospital over the next, you know, several months to try and figure out how we can get on a more sustainable path. I think Act 167 work may also be uh, helpful in this regard. So in some, I, I support this uh, recommendation and this motion. Thank you. Uh, I'll say the same thing everyone said. This was the hospital that gave me the greatest struggle in what the right approach was. I really went back and forth many times and struggled with what would be best. And ultimately, I did conclude that a large rate increase is needed and we need to support St. Johnsbury and the hospital. Um, so it is a large increase and we, I, I think it's needed. I think it's needed for sustainability and I support um, the 8% increase. Um, I don't have anything else. Um, I'll open it up to public comment. I'm sorry, I should healthcare advocate. I'll go to the healthcare advocate first. Uh, I'll just say no, no further comment. And I also want to just at least take a second to say, Thank you uh, to everyone involved in this year's process. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Um, Mr. Tester. Thank you. 
Um, so uh, first off, I just want to acknowledge, I, I, I know that you're on the last fumes here and you're wrapping up this entire process and I appreciate everybody's time. Um, the staff of the Green Mountain Care Board has been really great to work with uh, over the last several months as we've worked through this process and, and we appreciate everything they've done. Um, you know, uh, I get it, it's, this is challenging. And um, and in the budget we submitted um, represented, represents our, um, what we believe we need to best support this community's needs. As some of you have noted, you know, the Northeast Kingdom, this is, this is the oldest um, um, region of the state, has the highest, uh, some of the highest poverty rates in the entire region. Um, I get the cost side, but at the same time, um, you know, we've worked really hard over the last decade to meet those communities' needs, working on social drivers for health, not just um, taking care of people when they show up in our emergency department, in our clinics, or need our hospital services. Um, the budget we submitted really represents our uh, best effort to make meaningful investments into some of those efforts and projects that you already discussed. Um, it's, it's really exploring the partnerships <clears throat> that we feel are necessary to best meet our region's needs, but it also represents the investments we're making in our staff and attempting to grow the workforce so that we're not relying so heavily on travelers. Um, I am concerned that um, this budget language, if you adopt it as presented, it will impact our ability to uh, move forward. Um, we can't do it without days cash on hand and we can't do it without margin. And, and, and I, I do believe that this um, proposal will put us at risk. Um, that said, I understand that you have a difficult task ahead of you. So um, we'll, we'll work together to figure it out. Thank you, Mr. Tester. Um, and I, I, I appreciate you discussing the investments in the social drivers of health and the partnerships. Those are something that are important that we did note in your submission. Thanks for highlighting those because um, they are somewhat unique and important. Um, any other public comment? I'll read the motion and I, I will move to, to approve Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital's budget as modified hereby with a 9% increase from fiscal year 22 to 24 budgeted NPR FTP reduced from 16.3 and a commensurate reduction in operating expenses from the submitted budget. An 8% charge increase from 23 to 24 reduced from 15 and subject to the standard budget conditions as approved by the board and an additional condition that NVRH shall submit to the board within three months a plan addressing NVRH's efforts to reduce costs and control overall expense growth. Further, NVRH is required to meet monthly with board staff for monitoring purposes. A second. Um, Mr. McCracken, would you take a roll call on this, please? Hmm. Yeah, Chair Foster, I'm going to call the roll in uh, alphabetical order. Um, Member Holmes? Yes. Uh, Member Lunge? Yes. Uh, Member Merman? Yes. Uh, Member Walsh? Yes. Uh, and Chair Foster? Yes. Um, the motion carries unanimously, and um, there will be an 8% charge increase for NVRH and a 9% increase in NPR and FPP. Um, we had one last agenda item, uh, which is a review of the standard conditions, and I'll turn to Mr. McCracken for that. Um, thank you, Chair Foster. So um, we're wrapping this up with a correction in the standard conditions that we had been presenting as um, we had discussed before there have been some rewriting here and in the revisions, um, <clears throat> some provision of it was omitted. So I'm gonna add that back in here. We look at condition B, the approvals here are to the hospital's overall change in charge and commercial rate increases. Um, that obviously has been a part of the board's motion language as you've gone through and approved the hospitals. Uh, so we're correcting that in this clause B by adding that back in. 
Um, I will just take a minute to to um, remind everyone how we changed the way that these particular conditions were phrased were were written up. Um, they now say at the hospitals. They are a cap on the hospital's change in charge and commercial rate increases. Um, we've made that explicit that it's a cap. Uh, we've also clarified that no commercial rate increase for any payer can be above that cap. Um, and we've also made explicit, uh, as has been the board's intention in past years, that commercial rate increases with respect to any payer may be less than that cap as that's negotiated between the hospital and the payer. Um, also flag the condition that we've added this year that the commercial rate increase in that cap is a maximum and it's subject to negotiation between the hospital and commercial insurers. The hospital shall not represent the maximum commercial rate increase approved by the board uh, or the expected commercial NPR based on that rate increase as amount set or guaranteed by the Green Mountain Care Board in the hospital's negotiation with insurers. Um, and then we've also included here that the hospital's expected commercial NPR <clears throat> based on its budget, either as approved or as adjusted in the order, um, is an amount that if approved as submitted was included with the hospital's budget and if modified is something that we can back into holding together, holding constant the other assumptions in the budget. Um, we're asking the hospitals to report their actual expected commercial NPR if it's different than that, um, not later than March 15th, or if there are particular hospital situations that require a later date that could be approved by the chair. Um, there are reasons that that expected commercial NPR would change um, related to kind of the payer mix or um, other factors, but that would be for the hospital to explain if there was some variation. Uh, so with that, I would like the board to, um, if it's acceptable, approve the correction that we've noted in the prior slide. I'm happy to take any questions or, or comments as well. I have no comment or questions um, on this. If any other board members do, please go ahead. Okay, um, then I will move to approve the correction to the standard budget conditions as presented to the board. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Member Lund, were you an aye as well? I was. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Um, there's one short additional agenda item uh, that was not on the calendar, which is a big thank you to uh, Sarah Lindbergh. We will miss you, Sarah. Uh, uh, yeah. Sarah's really <laughs> unique in that she has respect uh, everywhere, uh, at the board staff, at the board level, and across the healthcare advocate and all the regulated entities. Um, Member Lund has worked with uh, Director Lindbergh for a long time, so I'll turn to her for some comments. First of all, Sarah, my apologies, because you're going to be embarrassed. So just say that up front. I know you well. Uh, Sarah and I have worked together for at least a decade, I think a few years longer than that. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you, Sarah. Uh, you've been an incredible asset to the state of Vermont and the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, in my former role working for Governor Shumlin as the director of healthcare for the state of Vermont, I had three data people that in the state, the entire state that I would call upon, and Sarah was always my first call. Um, as you might imagine, in that role, we had some very heavy lifting to do in terms of reports and analysis and planning for health system change. Um, and I could not have done that without Sarah. She has taught me a lot about data, about statistics, about Vermont specific data sources, which ones are better than others. Um, and I know I'm not alone in that. Um, she has also behind the scenes tire tirelessly worked to ensure that data sources have been improved. 
um, under her stewardship, uh, VCures has become much more stable and reliable as a data source. Um, that is really important and really not sexy work. Um, and she recognized the importance of it and highlighted it when others, I think, um, did not do so. And then just lastly, um, in the, her current role, she really has transformed this process into being much more data driven. As she uh, has said many times, we still have work to do, but we wouldn't be where we are today without her. And she's done all of this, all of this tirelessly. I can't say how many times I've woken up to see e emails at two thirty from her at two thirty in the morning. Um, I'm not waking up. Just to be clear, I'm not waking up then, but that's when she sends them. Um, her humor makes her a joy to work with, and um, I just can't say enough how sad I am uh, to see you go, Sarah. But. Your new employer has no idea what an asset they have, although they will soon learn and um, appreciate you as much as we do. So thank you. The state of Vermont has really benefited from your service. Thank you very much, Member Lund. Uh, well said. I know we all feel those, share those feelings, so thank you. Thank you, Sarah. We will have a little kickoff party for you tonight, or goodbye party. Uh, and thanks for everything you did in this hospital budget process. And yeah. with that, is there? I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. Do you want to say? Anything? Yeah, just um, yeah, it, it's been an honor to serve, and I just um, yeah, and I wish I could have got some more done, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep working. <laughs> Got a great deal done, so thank you. All right, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. If I don't second, does that mean Sarah can't leave? <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering I guess if not, play so that. I'll, I'll <laughs> second. <laughs> um, before, before we vote, I will also thank the healthcare advocate for their amazing diligence in this process, and also each of the 14 hospitals and their executive leadership. These are really immensely difficult decisions and the data and information and the conversation is critical to doing so. I hope and appreciate everyone recognizing how hard these calls are and we recognize that they're not one size fits all and there's a lot of judgment and discretion and um, expertise that goes into it, including Sarah's um, quite heavily. So thank you for all the entities that put in so much work uh, to making this as, as positive of a process as it could be. And with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned.